Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Andrew. I'm very proud to lead the Priceline business for API. I've been coming to APP for uh, 20 years, and I confess um, in recent years, my enthusiasm has probably been less than ideal. But I have to say, let me add to the many comments uh, this week when I say it is seriously good to re-engage with all of you, make some new friends as we all sit down and think about our businesses in this sort of post-COVID world. I look forward to doing that work with all of you. At API and Priceline, uh, the last year, like it has been for all of us, it's been a catalyst to review what we're doing and, and think about what we need to change uh, to ensure that our customers continue to prosper. Uh, one important undertaking in Priceline is obviously how we double down on our digital engagement with our customers. In API, we're putting massive investments into our infrastructure distribution systems, particularly in New South Wales with a multi, multi-million dollar investment. But also we've put a lot of work into the intangibles in Priceline, a lot of work into building what I call a belief structure for the business. Uh, this internal belief, it's not a customer marketing line, although it will help to inform that. Rather, it's an answer to the all-important question of why that every business, I think, needs to work on. In Priceline, we believe that customers can only feel better when they feel they matter. I suspect that belief resonates with many of the people in this room working in pharmacy. It logically leads to an important next question, however. And the introduction to our guest speaker will then make sense. If someone matters to you, well, what does that now require you to do for them? Principally, in my view, it requires that you know them, that you know their fears, you know their frustrations, that you know their desires. And then act in a way that seeks to alleviate those fears and support their desires. So our next speaker, well, he's going to help us understand some of what the post-COVID consumer marketplace looks like. And at this point, you have a choice. You can take good notes, you can go back to your businesses and implement many of the ideas that are put forward today. It's hard work. Or you can join Priceline. It's two easy choices. <laughs> Never, whatever your choice, either way, I'm sure you will enjoy hearing from Gary Mortimer. Gary is a professor of marketing and consumer behaviour at the QUT Business School. Prior to joining QUT, Gary spent over 25 years working with some of Australia's largest general merchandise and food retailers. In 2020, he was appointed as the chair of the Australian Retailers Association Consumer Research Advisory Committee and, the expert advise, and, on the, and to the expert advisory group for the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and the Environment. His research has been published in journals far and wide widely recognised as Australia's leading retail expert, industry keynote speaker and media commentator. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gary Mortimer. Good, good morning, everyone. It's, it's great to be back. Um, I uh, realised uh, earlier this week as I was putting the, the finishing touches to this presentation, this is my, um, my third uh, I guess, opportunity to speak at APP. The, the very first time was way back in 2012, uh, nine years ago. So uh, a lot has changed in the last uh, nine years. Uh, and, and predominantly this uh, global pandemic has been a significant change that we've all experienced over the last uh, 12 months, um, which is challenging. And it's challenged the way businesses and retailers operate and it's challenged and changed the way consumers behave. So I'm hoping over the next, uh, I guess, little while to share some insight into how consumers have behaved during the pandemic, how are they behaving now as they come out of the pandemic, and then I wanna look forward into the future and say, what do we see happening uh, as we, uh, we get back to some level of normality? So I guess the discussion today will start with the COVID consumer. What did we see manifest uh, over the last 12 months, certainly from March 2020. Then we're going to look at some uh, Ernst Young or EY data to, to look at their modelling to say what types of consumer segments might we see evolve as we come out of this crisis. Uh, and then I'm going to put my crystal ball in and, and I'm going to look 12 months into the future and say, well, what do we see will change uh, you know, as we continue through 2021 and 2022 as borders open uh, and restrictions lift and we get back to some level of normality. 
Let's start with, um, with this lady, the COVID consumer. So I want us all to put our sort of uh, our memory back in place and think back to March 2020. A cruise ship arrives in Sydney. There's some reported cases of COVID. There's some hospitalizations. Uh, borders start to close. International borders start to close. Stay-at-home directives are announced. We're working from home. We're uh, teaching uh, online classes at universities. We're doing homeschooling. There's six weeks of my life I'm never getting back. It was challenging. And what was the very first thing we saw eventuate with consumer behaviour? Toilet paper. <laughs> See? And I didn't even prompt that. It surprised many of us, the toilet paper um, situation. And I worked with some pretty smart consumer psychologists and consumer behaviour experts. And you know, some of them even reconceptualised Maslow's hierarchy of needs, saying that potentially Maslow was in fact wrong. And before we need clothes and food, we obviously need toilet paper. But it wasn't just toilet paper. Stockpiling certainly eventuated pretty quickly. We saw it across the supermarket sector. We saw it across the general merchandise sector. You would have saw it play out also in pharmacy as well. And that's not unreasonable. In times of uncertainty, when things are looking a bit dire, what do we do? We sort of stockpile everything we can get that we need because we think things are going to close. Similarly, we, we saw this, cocooning. If you haven't come up with the term or come across the term, have a look at it later, Google it later, cocooning and COVID-19. I've got a colleague that works at Macquarie University, uh, Associate Professor Jana Bowden. She does a little bit of pub publishing in this cocooning idea. Originally termed, uh, developed by Faith Popcorn, apparently that's her surname, Faith Popcorn, uh, in New York. And she, she saw this phenomenon play out uh, at the end of the 1970s, the crazy 1970s, Studio 54, lots of drinking, lots of partying, lots of recreational drugs. And then in the early 80s, people shut themselves off from that. They went home, they closed themselves off, they surrounded themselves with their family and their friends, and they felt safe. The same phenomenon took place after the 9-11 uh, tragedy in New York. People just cocooned, they stayed at home, and they felt comfortable and safe in their own regard. Uh, same things have taken place in France and also in London during terrorist attacks, and this is exactly what we saw take place here in Australia. Listen, to some extent that was driven by stay-at-home directives, but really, despite the fact that things opened up, people still feel safe at home. As a direct result of that, spending time at home meant we're doing stuff around the house. That meant we're fixing up the house, we're putting on that back deck, we're painting the walls, we were updating our lounge rooms and our bedrooms. That played out in Bunnings. So you have a look at Bunnings sales data for that particular quarter and that particular half. Did exceptionally well. There was a shift back to home activities. So things like jigsaw puzzles and modelling all picked up. Games whole, uh, gaming consoles sold out. Streaming services went through the roof. We started to do home exercise, solo exercise, yoga. Uh, we saw the same numbers in Rebel Sport and also uh, uh, athleisure uh, retailers like Lorna Jane. And of course, online shopping went through the roof. Let's have a look at some numbers on online shopping. I used to look at ABS data all the time. I really like looking at the ABS data. I think that the March figures were out earlier this week or late last week when I had a quick look at them. Traditionally, the, the ABS data in retail trade always lifted by about 0.2 or maybe 0.8. If it got to 0.8, we were really happy. As COVID hit, the numbers bounced all over the place. It was really, really hard to determine what was happening. But the growth rates in online were just phenomenal. Between March shutdown and December, nearly 66% uh, growth in online shopping. I think Woolworths numbers came out recently. They reported a 90% growth in their online food division. Uh, depending on what, uh, I guess, benchmarks you use, there's an NAB online sales index is a really good benchmark. Um, Australia Post put out some numbers occasionally as well. I tend to use ABS. ABS tends to be just more reliable data. Uh, about $45 billion spent online last year. To give you some context, traditionally up to about 2019, we were spending about $27.5, $28 billion a year online. So we've literally shifted ahead three years in under seven months. That caught a lot of the big guys out. We know that Woolworths and Coles shut down their online divisions just for a period of time till they're able to scale up and get ready for the demand. In relation to physical sales, 
Online in Australia was always about eight and a half, nine percent of physical sales. You know, still 90 cents in every dollar still spent in store. That's shifting towards 14 percent. I suspect by the middle of this year we'll be at 15 percent. Food retailing, which was always quite challenging because it was perishable, now getting towards six percent. In fact, Woolworths numbers are at six percent now. So six percent of their food is coming from the online channels, and we're seeing Woolworths and Coles really invest heavily into those capabilities, whether it's using third-party providers like Ocado and Coles or automatic fulfillment centres and decentralised fulfillment centres that the Woolies uh, team are using as well. We had a shift to essentials. Yep. We saw that play out in Kmart. We saw that just more recently playing out with Big W and the revitalised Big W divisions. But that shift to essentials also means the validation and the viability of private label products. Now, on average, supermarkets are generating about 20% of their revenue from, or have been, from private label products. And they're investing heavily into this particular space. When I had a look at Cole's first half report that came out at the start of this year, um, their private label products delivered them nearly $6 billion worth of sales. So Aldi has legitimised private label in Australia. No longer is private label considered cheap and nasty. You're actually considered a smart and savvy shopper if you buy it. Private label now represents nearly one in three products bought in a coal store. Similar numbers out of Woolworths as well. 33% of their revenue is coming from online, uh, from, from um, their private label product. We're getting towards 40%. Uh, and the numbers in the UK were around about 45%. If you asked me eight years ago uh, when I last presented here, would we ever get to sort of 40%, you know, one in two products being bought in a supermarket being a private label? I would say not a chance. In Spain and Germany, it's close to 50%. Lots more margin in that private label product. I think there's some great opportunities there. And we've seen, obviously, the tiering effects happening as well. The other trend we saw during COVID was cutting deep. And that was reasonably because people were losing jobs, people were being stood down. So as a direct result, discretionary spending, spending on non-essential items, leisure, entertainment, certainly tourism, it all fell through the roof. Now, the latest numbers show that that's starting to bounce back now. We're starting to see some good numbers in those uh, discretionary spending categories and non-essential categories. So that was the five key trends we saw that took place from about March all the way through to about June and July of, of what took place when COVID, uh, COVID took hold. What I'd like to do now is refer to Ernst and Young, they now call themselves E&Y uh, e uh, data. And they looked at some data and, and have modelled the types of consumer segments that we will see uh, materialise out of, as we come out of, this particular uh, pandemic crisis. Now there's five, um, two of them are pretty small, uh, as in category size, um, but we'll talk about them briefly. Back with a bang, represents about 8% of the market they're suggesting. Back with a bang, so younger, uh, briefly disrupted, but mostly optimistic about the future. I would describe these as probably university age students, they're 18 to 25, they live at home, they don't have too many financial obligations, they're not mortgaged, they don't have big loans. Yes, they were financially disrupted for a short period of time. They may have worked in hospitality. They may have worked in a non-essential retail format. So they got stood down for a period of time, but they're back. They're back working, they're back out spending, and they're shopping, but a small component of the market. At the other end of that, uh, uh, that spectrum is keep cutting. Keep cutting is, it, it, this segment has been really doing it tough and have been doing it tough for a long period of time. Probably lower educated, uh, the classic Aussie battle that's been doing it tough for a long time. COVID simply was just another nail in the coffin for this particular segment. Only about seven to eight percent of the market suggested. Uh, they're they're going to continue to cut spending. So they're, they're not shopping in, in apparel, they're not buying um, you know, uh, non-essential items and discretionary spending categories. They're not traveling and they have no, no, no plans to travel. They're just making do with what they can do. The, the middle three are quite interesting. I'm going to go through them briefly, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time just really digging into them a bit more. The, 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 the first one is um, the cautiously extravagant. So middle to high income earners, very much focused on their health and well-being now, uh, but also very much focused on brands that they know and trust. Uh, during times of uncertainty, they're less inclined to experiment, to switch around and try different things, whether it's brands or products or services. 
staying frugal, okay, so they've shifted some of their spending patterns. So you know, they, they've probably tried to re-establish themselves. They may have been stood down for a period of time. They may have put their mortgages on deferment for a period of time. They're now starting to repay some of those. Maybe they had some um, cuts done to their rent, uh, but now they're paying full rent again. But interestingly about this group is they're quite pessimistic about the future. So they said, listen, we've gotten through the pandemic reasonably unscathed here in Australia. They're a bit conscious about the debt that they were carrying. But the next thing they're looking at is what's the next big thing that's going to hit me? And then there's um, getting back to normal. So you know, largely unchanged, largely unaffected. They may have worked in clinical roles like yourselves. They may have worked in the education sector. Listen, yeah, education sector, particularly the tertiary education sector, has been impacted, uh, but not to the extreme of uh, non-essential retail. So they're really looking forward, not next week. They're looking six months, 12 months in advance of what's the future hold for me. Let's have a look at um, this consumer to start with, the, the cautiously extravagant. So financially conservative consumer, they're, they're looking to increase their spending across non-essential categories and discretionary spending. But they are very tied to strong brands because they see trust in brand. They're less likely to swap to a different brand or switch to a different brand. Uh, they're less likely to move to a private label product. Interesting enough, they've got, very much they've got a very, very strong focus on um, health and well-being, and, and they're well read. Uh, they, they can see what's happened or is happening in India currently. They may have had colleagues overseas that have become ill. Uh, they've seen what played out in Europe and uh, Britain and the US last year. They're aware of that, and they're not necessarily coming in to see you because they're sick and they've got a prescription to fill. They're coming in to see you because they want advice. They want to get that blood pressure checked. They want to get a quick. Uh, jab to make sure they haven't got diabetes. They're thinking about losing weight. They're thinking about getting fitter and healthier because they saw their friends and their colleagues and other people around the world get really unwell. This is a great opportunity to sort of engage with this particular market. About 25% of the market, EMY, suggest it will be. The next one is staying fr frugal. So they've actually shifted their spend because you know, they're trying to re-establish themselves. Um, they're going to shift to low-cost basics. This is the, the customer that comes in to see you and they buy the 100 pack of paracetamol because they understand it's a low cost per tab. Uh, but in saying that, I think there's some great opportunities to tier your private label products if you're not already doing so. So they'll buy the cheap generic paracetamol, but when it comes to moisturising and face cream, they're probably going to more likely switch to a, a premium chemist owned brand. Yep. The other one is that they're probably still hibernating. They're still conscious of crowds and, and crowding. Uh, which means they're more likely to jump online and, and use those e-scripts or buy online and get those deliveries to their car or deliver to their home or a click and collect situation. Something that's going to be convenient and avoid the crowds. And this, I suspect, is probably me. Maybe it's you guys as well. Just getting back to normal. And it's a very, very large component of the market. About one in three, Ian Y is suggesting. So, so they want you know, the vaccine to roll out quickly. Um, they want to get their jabs quickly. They want international borders to open up. They want to plan for holidays. They want to be able, like myself, to travel around Australia and not encounter that risk that, uh, you know, Palaszczuk will close a border again and, and I'm stuck in hotel quarantine for 14 days. It's really interesting. I'm seeing a couple of players in this market, not in pharmacy, but in tourism, that are already connecting with this customer. In my Facebook feed, I'm, I'm getting lots of posts for the Cook Islands, and that's possibly because I'm researching the Cook Islands and they're remarketing to me. But I've been watching the, the, the narrative and the comments being made with the images, and I, I suspect it's the you know, Cook Island Travel uh, Tourism Board that's you know, pushing these messages. But a lot of the comments about, oh, the beaches look great and the resorts look great, and when can I come? And the responses that Tour um, Cook Island's Tourism Board or Association is providing is, listen, we're not, we're not open yet. Uh, international borders are still closed, but that's going to change. So they're just starting to re-establish that connection. There's this pent-up desire to get back to normal, pent-up desire to travel. So if there's a connection and a correspondence taking place, a relationship being built, uh, when it's time to travel, we've already established that connection. We see this a little bit with cruise liners and cruise ships as well. OK, so we've looked at sort of the, the key behaviours that played out during COVID, and now we've also looked at EY data to say, well, what do you think might actually occur as we come out of this crisis? What I'd now like to do is to look forward 
in the next sort of 12 to 18 months to see what will actually change and how can pharmacy, I guess, adapt or respond to these changes. The first one is declining CBD numbers. And if you've got pharmacy in CBD locations, then um, you know what this data is going to show. Uh, I apologise for all the little tiny white numbers at the bottom down there. We start right at this end. Uh, that's about January and February, March, uh, January and February 2020. Uh, we can see that the growth numbers, this is um, um, uh, go, Google mobility data, sits at about 0 to 5%, so about 5% more people going into CBD locations. The white line um, surprised myself and my colleague. I work with a colleague who's a geographer at University of Western Australia. The white line surprised us because that's Adelaide. We're thinking, who's going to Adelaide? Apparently there was the Fringe Festival or an Adelaide Comedy Festival on during January and February and the numbers jumped by about 25% going to Adelaide CBD. The next thing we can see is what happened in March in CBD foot traffic and commuter numbers. It just bottoms out. By about June, July, we're starting to come back to almost normality, although a lot of us are working from home, I'm teaching into a Zoom camera. And then we can see the red line, the effect of Melbourne's second lockdown. Uh, you know, I feel really sorry for the guys in Melbourne. If, you, if you're there for Melbourne, there's, you know, at one point there were between 87 and 90% down in foot traffic in Melbourne CBD. It's not responded, it hasn't come back yet. Uh, that, that's challenging. There's no way you can run a business when nine out of 10 customers aren't walking past your front door. Um, the one thing that, that um, my colleague, and I, I guess I support these claims, is that we, we're not back to normal yet, and we probably won't get back to normal for, for many, many years. The same sort of issues are falling out with public transport. Transurban report shows exactly the same thing. Obviously, Melbourne's a bit of a disaster. I tend to look at the future projected intentions to use public transport rather than what was happening during COVID. You can see what happened during COVID. No one was getting on trains or buses or trams. But in Melbourne, it looks like between 20 to 30% less intention to use buses and trains. Probably a lesser extent in Melbourne and in Sydney, but still you know, less uh, chance of catching a train in Sydney. Up here in Brisbane, it's buses. 15% people less likely to catch a bus into the city moving forward. That obviously has an, in, uh, an, an impact on uh, static advertising, if you're advertising on bus shelters or on train stations, but it also has an impact on foot traffic and your location. So what does this mean for pharmacy? I guess the rationalisation of sites and leases, if you're able to do so. Um, you know, do I really need five stores or four stores in this location if the, if the foot traffic's not going to come back for the next four or five years, if it does at all? I mean, already we've got accountancy firms saying, do I really need four levels of this building when I can actually have 80% of my workforce working remotely or coming in on a, on a, on a, on a cyclical schedule? Reanalyzing of foot traffic. So maybe I was here and there's high foot traffic in the mornings coming out of uh, train stations or transit terminals. Those numbers aren't there any longer. Maybe I need to sort of change what I believe to be a prime asset or a prime location. Maybe those prime locations have moved from CBD areas to slightly outerlying areas. Or possibly revisiting um, hours of operation. Do I need to be open at seven o'clock in the morning? Because originally there was a high traffic flow at that time in the morning. Now it's no longer there. The upside of that is they're not going into the CBD. Where are they going? Where they are going is into the suburbs. So we're referring to this as uh, essentially a return to localism, uh, supporting local brands, supporting local retailers, supporting local community pharmacy uh, and the like. Um, it's, it's really interesting, uh, you know, probably driven by this stay-at-home directive, but I look at my days now, whereas I'd get up at sort of 5.30 in the morning, I'd smash out a couple of emails, I'd get dressed, I'd get on a train, I'd go to the city, my campus is in the city, uh, I'd walk across the city um, through a couple of retail prisons, I'd get a cup of coffee, and I'd work all day and then I'd walk back across the city. I'd probably lose two hours of work time in my day. Now I get up, uh, I can do all of my emails, by seven o'clock I'm done, I can move on to research or whatever else I'm doing. By about midday I've worked for six hours, probably need to get out of my pyjamas at some point. And I do, and I go to gym, or I catch a coffee, or, or, or I grab some lunch, and I pop into my community pharmacy, my high street. Uh, so we're actually, we're actually more engaged, um, I guess, with local brands and, and, and local businesses. And I think there's some really great opportunities there, this return to localism, uh, but opportunities, but um, cautious, cautious opportunities. Um, 
We'll talk about intentions and behaviours um, shortly, but, but pharmacy is really well placed to promote local brands and Aussie-made products um, you know, on certain areas. And just making it easier for shoppers to identify what's a local brand, what's a locally manufactured product, you know, what's an Aussie-made brand. The reason I say cautiously, I, I want to talk about intentions and behaviours. I looked at a choice report that came out, I think it was earlier this week, where they ran some surveys and they found 93% of Aussies wanted to buy Aussie-made brands. That was up from 87% in, 19, uh, in, in 2019. Uh, at the same time, there was a decline in Chinese-made brands, uh, down to 21% of Australians wanting Chinese-made products. Now, intentions are great, but behaviours are better. When I looked at the ABS data that came out also last week, it showed that department stores in, uh, perform better out of all other segments uh, across retail. 8.5% growth in March 2021 compared to 2020. So we think about department stores, Big W and Kmart and Target, they do sell a predominantly range of Chinese made products. So while 93% of Aussie surveyed say we want to buy Aussie made, we also know that they're still quite happy to buy Chinese made, Japanese made and Bangladeshi made products as well. But it doesn't mean we walk away from that opportunity to promote local. The other thing I'm seeing what's really, really important is that storytelling about your local, credential, local credentials. So, you know, are you really local to the community? If you've been watching um, Metcash's IGA group really shift and change their messaging over the last few years, I have, and, and they've really sort of walked away from that price match, prices locked down campaign, you can't beat the big boys on price. So they've shifted to really driving that local community message. The latest ad that they do with their bottle shops, I think it's Bottolo is their brand that they're using currently. It's a really smart TVC, television ad. And it shows a young couple that's just moved into the suburb and they rush in on a rainy night and meet Paul, the, the owner, or the franchisee, I would assume, off the bottle shop, who gives them a bottle of red wine and off they go home. And the last thing of that is they're sitting around saying, oh, we're going to really like Paul. You know, Paul's a bit of a mate. And so they're really connecting with Paul, the brand, and being local. I think from this, from a, from a pharmacy perspective, walking to my community pharmacy and saying, Bob or Mary's the pharmacist, they've been looking after your community's health for the last 15 years. We really support the community. We support local clubs and schools. We do work experience with the kids. Really connecting and telling that story around your local credentials. Getting back to basics. Um, KPMG have found that about nearly 60% of consumers are now thinking about value for money. Uh, and when we talk about value for money, it's not necessarily low price. It's not cheap stuff. We don't all buy cheap wine or buy cheap suits or drive cheap cars. Value means different things for different consumers. And I'll give you an example. So I now have the convenience of sitting at home if I wish and I can do a Zoom consultation with my GP. And the GP can then send me an e-script, which is great. And now I've got choices. So I can send that e-script to probably four of the pharmacies that are within five kilometres where I live in Hendra in Brisbane. But what I'm thinking about is value for money, because I know that the brand of the medicine is going to be the same, the efficacy is going to be the same, probably the price is even going to be the same as well. So if I remove and strip all those things back, all I've got left is value. So it could be financial value, it could be if I send my e-script to this pharmacy, uh, I'm going to get some uh, loyalty points, which I can then redeem for something that I really want. There's some financial value in that for me. Or it could be convenience value. So if I send my e-script to pharmacy B, they can fill it in 10 minutes for me. It can be ready for click and collect in 30 minutes or delivered in two hours. So there's some convenience value there as well. Or alternatively, I could send my e-script to pharmacy C. And pharmacy C is really well connected with the community. I, I see them all the time, Bob or Mary, the pharmacist. Uh, they've been looking after the health of the community for the last 15 years. If I send it to there, I'm supporting my local community pharmacist and they're supporting me. There's some social value in that for me. So value for money becoming really important and it's not necessarily low price. The question always is, is what's your value proposition? What's your value add? Why is someone going to send their e-script to you and not to the bloke across the road? There's a level of unwillingness to experiment. Uh, and we're very conscious about where we spend our money and where we won't spend our money. This is very much like that um, cautiously extravagant shopper who's you know, willing to spend, but they want to stick with you know, 
trusted brands and trusted experiences. And particularly in times of uncertainty, we tend to stick with stuff we know because there's safety in stuff we know, which does suggest we've got this increasing risk adverse consumer still uh, as we come out of and as we move forward from this pandemic, which means we need to be thinking along the lines of risk mitigation strategies. Now, obviously, the good news, progressively, we're hoping to see more pharmacy involved practically in the rollout of COVID. That's a new service, a new cognitive service. So you're going to be experiencing challenges with trying to convince consumers to actually say, this is a good thing for you. So and listen, if you're selling new products, that's going to be a challenge. I'm going to stick to brands I know and love. OK, so money back guarantee, satisfaction guarantee. I'm going to implement a new service. It's going to be a vaccine service. OK, so testimonials, expert advice, here's access to the real data. Virtual has become the, the new norm. Uh, and uh, it's really interesting. I wish I had shares in Zoom. Zoom last year went from 10 million users to over 200 million users in one year. MS Teams, 12 million users in less than seven days. All of last year, I was doing this by Zoom. It wasn't a great experience. I do miss getting back into crowds. Uh, but also, all of last year, I was teaching to uh, a lecture theatre that had 585 <coughs> seats and had zero students in it. So I was teaching to a video camera. Uh, no, no activities, no questions, very, very difficult to actually deliver in that sort of um, situation. Friday night drinks became virtual drinks. I did it a couple of times. I have to say it was really awkward myself. A couple of colleagues in different offices with a glass of wine. It's not the same. But virtual exercise classes, virtual cooking classes, virtual has become the new norm. Um, I, I go to gym occasionally and, and I've noticed now more frequently um, people beside me with their mobile phone open. I'm going, why are they looking at their mobile phone? What they're doing is they're looking at a little video grab of the exercise and then they're replicating the exercise to get the best out of their, their, their session. So it's just the norm. So I guess the question then is, is how well is pharmacy place or your pharmacy place to adapt and, and leverage that opportunity? I'll give you an example. I, I had to go to my, um, my, my physio late last year. I had a bit of a rotor cuff strain too much time at gym, I suspect. Um, and, and I went in and after the consultation, it was no different from any other consultation I'd had with physios over the last few years, um, she said to me, oh, we'll, send you a, um, we'll send you an email with an, a link in it for those exercises later, because you know, we know what you know, patients are like. Once you give them three exercises to do, they'll forget as soon as they walk out the door. So my expectation was, uh, when I get home, I get the email, there's the link, it'll be a static PDF file, a couple of diagrams, you know, do this exercise with a band and do that exercise with a band. But what I got was a link, but three little video grabs, just 30 second grabs with a voiceover. And I thought, that's a really smart thing. So it's stored in my phone now, so when I'm at you know, I can just remember which way do I pull that band this way and that way. That's the value add. So when I think about my physio, I could have gone to any physio, I could have paid the same amount of money, would have been the same gap in my private health insurance, would have been the same exercise, the same treatment, but the value add for physio A, my physio, was this little link that gave me three little videos of the exercises I had to do. And that's scalable. I imagine they would have had 100 little exercises, all little 30 and 60 second ads. And if someone walked in with a lower back strain or a calf strain, they would have gone, well, that patient needs that one and that one and that one. Really nice, really sort of connecting that visual element and that virtual element to the service, adding that value to the customer. Fear and anxiety, it's still prevalent today. Um, I think about my parents who are in their late 70s. My father had his uh, vax uh, a couple of months ago. I had my vax on Monday. I feel great, no headaches, nothing at all. My mother won't have the vax. She is terrified. She watches Channel 9 News, she reads the Courier Mail, uh, she sees the 18-year-old um, student nurse that got blood clots. She thinks there's a, a correlation and, and she's concerned. Uh, the latest story that's doing the rounds this week, this morning and last night, you've probably all seen it, the hairdresser. The hairdresser that's done some research and has identified a correlation between vaccines and fertility. So she's decided to ban people who have had the vaccine from coming to get their hair cut. Now, we all know that's bullshit. But some people don't. 
there's enough of the community, a small group, my mother, who go, she's not going to get pregnant. She's 70. <laughs> but the, 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 we'll see that story. That's, it's on news.com. It was on 9 and 7 last night and 10. Um, and going, oh, maybe, that, maybe that is possible. Maybe there is a link because a hairdresser is telling me. Um, it, it's disappointing. You've got, you've, you've got your jobs cut out for you in, in pharmacy. You are the front line of, of this. You are placed uh, to reduce um, and mitigate this risk and dispel mistruths. Um, it's, and it's not just the mistruths. We'll, we'll get to that very, very shortly. I, I think about my mother. My mother will go to a GP if she's sick. Um, but, but rarely does she go to see a GP. But she's more likely to walk into one of your pharmacists, pharmacies uh, and, and pick up some healthcare, you know, uh, headache tablets or uh, coughs and cold medicine. You have that opportunity in the coal face to engage with your patient that walks in for their headache tablets or their, so, you know, their, their throat lozenges and say, have you had your vaccine yet? Oh, no, I'm not doing that. No, you know, I won't get pregnant. Um, well, hang on, let me give you some information about that. What, what, what's your concerns? What's your fears? That, that scope of practice, being able to dispel those mistruths and say, listen, don't read what's on the front page of the Courier Mail. Have a, let's have a look at the, the science and the evidence. The other stuff is around crowding. We still see this, you know. It's all those mechanisms retailers put in place, you put in place, so sneeze screens, hand sanitising stations, please stand on this square, please scan this QR code, all designed to keep us healthy, also for some, create levels of anxiety. So every time I see a sneeze screen, a hand sound, I'm, I'm fearful that I might get something in this crowded area. My local pharmacy uh, is Terry White at Turnbull and they've refitted their store. It looks fabulous. The one thing I've noticed in the scripts in, scripts out area where you're mostly waiting around, lots of space now, yeah? So it reduces that fear of crowding. So pharmacy does play a vital role in dispelling mistruths and reducing that level of risk um, you know, if you're going to shop online, that's great. How can I make it easier for you so you don't have to come into contact with people if that's something that's concerning you? Can I have a, a, a coloured area where I can park my car, ring a phone number, somebody comes and just drops that off into my car for me, my, my script or my products that I've bought online. So ultimately, customers will seek to uh, trust you. They'll turn to you for trust. Like I said, they're more likely to walk into a pharmacy this week than they are to see their GP. And it's certainly a lot cheaper to walk into my pharmacy and ask a question than it is to go see my GP. The challenge, of course, is to make sure that we're balancing the information we provide consumers with evidence and not sugarcoating it. Yes, there are some risks, and we need to be open about those risks. Now look at Lorna Jane Shield. You know, if, if we had known last year that all we had to do to protect ourselves from COVID was to wear yoga pants. <laughs> we could have saved millions and millions of dollars in developing vaccines. As we finish, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be back and thanks for coming along and listening. I just want to sort of pick up a couple of key points here. The shift to online is permanent. Uh, we're not going to see the same massive growth figures that we've seen last year because we'll start to cycle those numbers. But the number doesn't change. 45 to $50 billion will be spent online this year. Digital has become the new norm. Virtual has become the new norm. Whether it's for digital shopping, online shopping, whether it's engagement, sharing of information, the customer experience, you need to be in that space. You need to have your capabilities set up, particularly in the e-commerce platform area. There is a renewed focus on health and well-being. Uh, you know, even people, and I consider myself to be reasonably fit and healthy, um, I, I still go and talk to a pharmacist about getting a, a blood pressure check because my GP three months ago said, just keep an eye on your blood pressure. Uh, and we've seen people getting sick. We're seeing young people get sick. So we need that, that, that area of focus. There is a return to, uh, to base, back to basics for some consumers, particularly value for money. Remember, value for money is not low price. It's value for money is different things for different people. So what's your value add? What's your value proposition compared to the guy across the road? There's a shift to save for some, which means a growth of private label products. We've seen that play out in the supermarket divisions for, for many years now, but also a tiering effect. So we'll have those that want the budget buy, but also a premium chemist owned brand. Shoppers are making more considered choices, back to that value for brand proposition, and are very focused on localization or localism. So what am I doing to support the values of my local community, and can I really connect well with my customers? 
There's an unwillingness to change and experiment, and this is always the case in times of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to stick to a retailer I know or a brand I know, which means we need to be focused on risk mitigation strategies. How do we make consumers make more informed decisions and reduce that level of risk? Remembering to take a very balanced approach to giving that information out. Here's the facts, here's the statistics in very simple layman's terms. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been great coming back to APP. Hopefully I'll come back next year. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Cheers. I've got a couple of questions for you, Gary. Uh, we've had a couple come through. There is, the, there is the toilet paper question, of course, but I, I'd like to go beyond that because we know that happened and that's all very great. I'm uh, interested to understand um, possibly the psychology behind the consumer behaviour around the toilet paper rush. Yep. More importantly, how can we maybe create that in other environments to create that sort of demand for other things? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Aldi ski sale coming up this weekend. Oh, okay, watch, yeah, yeah, watch yeah, it. yeah. The toilet paper thing was really interesting. If you, so two things happened. Number one, there was an operational problem. If you look down a supermarket shopping aisle of toilet paper, they can probably carry about 250 packets of toilet paper in an entire aisle side, right? So, and there's no storage in the back. I used to work for Coles many years ago. Uh, so it only you, you might be able to service 250 customers all buying one pack. When as soon as 250 customers walked in and bought two packs, they emptied the shelves. Then there was the visual. Uh, media jumped onto that pretty quickly because it's, it's great to show an empty aisle because that just indicates that every single aisle is empty, but it's not. You think about tin tuna, you can carry thousands and thousands and thousands of cans of tin tuna and tin you know, baked beans, but the toilet paper aisle, you can strip it open in sort of less than an hour and a half. The second thing was herd mentality, the psychology behind it. Everyone's buying toilet paper, there's safety in numbers. I'm gonna buy some toilet paper as well. And I've gotta be honest, I was guilty as well. I bought two packs. But only two packs of like 10, not two packs yeah. of like, and you weren't selling it on Facebook or anything? No. No, 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 cool. No, yeah. Everyone's so, buying white shoes at the moment too, just yeah, saying, yeah, yeah, looks yeah great. everyone's doing it. <laughs> it looks like on the white stage, oh, it no, looks like I you have, have no feet. feet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll just turn this way so you can see that I am walking. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so scarcity. Yes. And uh, again, you wouldn't recommend that we would be um, stripping our shelves and only leaving one of them and creating a fight. I'm not suggesting that. No. Uh, but that drives that. If you were, if you owned a pharmacy mm -hmm. right now, and you had limited resource, what yeah. are two, one, two or three things you'd be doing right now to respond to what's happening with consumer behaviour? Okay, so uh, my, my thoughts about unlimited resources. Um, Limited, limited, oh, okay, I thought it was unlimited. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, as a pharmacist, I'm assuming I'll be behind the dispensary most times, and I'm busy behind the dispensary, which means I'm relying on my PAs to, to, to sell the message for me. Now, I know that the person that's walking in the door, some of the people that are walking in the door are concerned. They're risk adverse. Um, they've, they've probably read the report last night across the media that, yeah, pharmacy's gonna be assisting in the rollout of the vaccine, uh, probably in some regional centres to start with, but mostly we'll start to get towards October, November, we'll start to see that roll out and ramp up. Um, I need to make sure my PAs are really well versed in engaging with my customer and giving that, that, that information, uh, you know. They, they don't have time. The, the last thing you want to do is have a PA go, let me just check with the pharmacist, I'll come straight back to you, because you just immediately lose that level of trust. Yeah. So I'd invest in PA yeah, training. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, of course, API and Priceline for sponsoring the session. We truly appreciate it.